Good morning, gentlemen. Hope everything's good in your part of the U.S. of A. And uh, hope the weather's good for you. Real exciting week here so far. And the good thing about it is we're not done yet. Welcome to uh, to our show and our session here. And guys, let's just go ahead and get it started here. You know, let's talk a little bit about what fluid dampener really is. I mean, explain to those folks. That I know they're on here saying, hey, Hammond, you're being a big dummy. But let's go back to like the very beginning, start with A, and let's work our way through the alphabet. Sure, sure, Jeff, I can I can feel that one. Uh, first, I just want to thank Francis for having us on the whole crew at EPAR Trade. It's been a fantastic week. Again, uh, we all know it's a tough situation out there, but I got to tell you, we've, we've fluid ever is going strong this year. We've done a lot of pivoting and uh, met a lot of great people online all over the world uh, by doing these virtual seminars. So uh, again, thank you for having us on. Those who are not familiar with Fluid Amper, it is a harmonic damper. Uh, the parent company is Vibratech TVD. Now together, Vibratech TVD and Fluid Damper, we do torsional vibration analysis on engines, be it race engines or OEM applications, marine, gas compression, rail, on the whole gamut of industries. For the racing industry, we get in and we look at the uh, engine character, the vibration characteristics of the engine. What is that crankshaft doing under high RPM, high loads? How is it twisting? How is it rebounding? And then we develop a long lasting durable solution that's gonna allow that engine to hold up under high torque and high horsepower and high durability. Um, so Fluid Amper has been in the racing industry since 1985. It's where we do a lot of proving ground that later goes on to our OEM products or to the military products. Um, throughout the, uh, the last 10 years, I've been involved with the company. We've brought forth a lot of training materials. Uh, I've offered a lot of the uh, presentations and, and dealer trainings that are out there, but even I have my sources and uh, I'm bringing on one of mine today uh, is Aaron Nyman. Uh, I've known Aaron for about 10 years now, fantastic guy. He's our uh, vibration solutions manager and senior product engineer. Um, I've gotten to know Aaron over the past 10 years and a lot of my knowledge uh, that we share out to the dealers and uh, to the industry comes from Aaron. So I wanted to make sure I got him in and got him introduced. And um, I'm gonna turn this over now to, to Aaron, let him uh, say a few words. Well, thanks for that, Brian. Uh, and then, like Brian mentioned, you know, I've been working with Fluid Amper for about 11 years now um, and nothing but uh, you know just complete immersion into the damper design world. Um, so a little bit about the viscous damper. Uh, it was invented here um, in here out, just outside of Buffalo, New York, uh, and presented to the SAE conference in 1946. So it's a it's a technology that's been around for a long time, but it has uh, over the years it's been adapted with changes in uh, advancements in technology, uh, both machining and uh, internal bearing technology and all that. And it's still cutting edge uh, technology that's used in high performance applications like hypercars and supercars. Um, so uh, one of the big advantages of this damper by design is an SFI spec uh, certification, so it can be used in racing applications. Um, and they, you know, what it does is it basically it acts like a little radiator on the end of your crankshaft. And there's a there's a weight inside of the part that moves in and out of phase with your crankshaft when you're getting vibration pulses. And that when that weight moves in and out of phase opposite the motion of the vibration, um, the the weight will shear through a highly viscous fluid in there. Um, if you've ever worked with like uh, silicone for for like caulking agents and stuff like that, it's a very similar thickness to that but it doesn't have a curing agent. So like, you know, you get that vinegar smell when you're working with silicone caulk, that's what causes it to turn back into a solid. Um, Brian's got a good example up on the board there. Uh, the silver portion is the internal inertia. And uh, that's not bonded to the inside, so that can move in and out of phase at any frequency, where a rubber bonded part has a start-stop frequency, uh, usually about 50 hertz. So um, the big advantage to the, the viscous damper is the broadband damping ability. And also the robust design, so it can handle a lot more power input because it's not trying to transmit the vibration energy through a small strip of rubber. Now, Aaron, you we hear a lot. That, Brian? Go ahead, Jeff. I said it looked like you were going to add to that. Would you like to do a little follow up with that? About oh what no, I, what about? I was sure what I was holding up here was the, the cutaway, just to give a little visualiz visualization to what Aaron right. was discussing. So here we have our internal inertia ring. It's in fully encapsulated in the housing. There is a very, very thin shear gap. 
and see you get the focus right. So tiny, we can't even get it in focus. <laughs> uh, and then the silicone is pressure injected into it and it just fills up the small gap there, but it's a shearing motion of the ring in and out of phase with crankshaft vibration that's gonna turn that vibration into heat. And then this acts as a radiator. Uh, once that's set up and designed right, the durability on these is, it, it, there isn't, I mean, it's phenomenal. It doesn't wear out in a race application. Um, now, we and hear- I'll just add on what Brian was saying there, a lot of what governs the, the heat capability of the damper is similar to, you know, it's all the outer geometry of the housing and the materials that we use. So once we reach a, what we call a stabilization temperature with a given vibration, that, 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 that doesn't get any hotter than that. So they're really good for high temperature applications with low airflow, like uh, racing, most racing applications, especially with stop car, um, and then also endurance racing. But they're also really good for performance marine applications too, because of the heat stabilization. Well, guys, I can speak from personal experience to back of the good old days when we had the uh, basically production uh, damp that used to be on the front of the engines that, you know, it'd be balanced and, you know, it'd have its holes drilled in it for the balancing part of it with a thin rubber, rubber uh, application ring, uh, you know, in it. And I know back in the day, that was one of the things on our checklist was to make sure, hey, is, is it, is the rubber still in where it's supposed to be or is it starting to come out? I know when you guys came along with the, with this, which revolutionized, I think, the idea of exceeding, you know, 7,000 RPM. Uh, and that's how long ago it's been, at least in, in my way of thinking. It, it put an element of safety into turning these engines into a, a range that we had never thought we could reach. And now, I mean, that reach, that range now is basically off the chart. So, it's something that simple that has really stabilized and given engine builders and, and design guys uh, almost a free spin. I know you. I know you've had to adjust things for that, but I think I'm I'm amazed of the capability of what this little, pretty much what I consider simplistic part can have such a huge effect. Kind of leads me into a question for you, Aaron, as you know, how has things changed in your perspective over the, even the last 10 years? Because uh, as Jeff had mentioned, it's getting phenomenal out there. We're seeing cars turning to 11,000 RPM now. And uh, how has fluid damper been adapting with that? Well, the, the biggest thing that I can see, Brian, is um, everything's getting tighter. Space is getting tighter. Airflow restrictions are getting tighter. Um, powertrains, uh, more so on an OEM level, but even in performance applications, everything needs to get smaller, lighter, more compact. And that affects the, the front of the damper. Uh, anybody that's familiar with a small block Chevy application knows that, you know, if, if you were to order a, a crate motor right out of the catalog or pull it out of the, pull out of a truck or, you know, a car to build, you can have anything from a six and a quarter inch damper all the way up to an eight inch damper. And that's almost unheard of nowadays with uh, you know, different applications for different engines. I mean, the LS based and the LT based are still right around seven and three quarter in diameter, but a lot of things have integrated belt drives now. Um, they have a bunch of other different integrated features, which cuts into the damper envelope. Uh, because you know, as you saw earlier in the cutaway that we need a certain amount of space for that mass. So one of the big things that uh, I've seen you know, even in the last 10 years is getting creative with the shape of the parts. So, um, you know, a lot of times if you looked at older dampers from, let's say the early 2000s and back, they all have a very similar shape. It looks basically more or less like a donut shape and then it has a different feature for how it interfaces with crankshaft. Well, nowadays, most dampers have very unique looks from engine to engine. Um, you know, you could have some shaping, of, you know, we do a lot of inline six parts for two Toyota two days a week race applications. Uh, they're really big in the drifting, uh, drifting scene. And that one actually has a fairly large inertia ring that's fairly thin, so you can actually tuck it behind the belt drive systems. And you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of import performance engines, a lot of import racing engines have very small, um, they have very small uh, envelopes available because everything fits inside of that that crankshaft pulley, and there's no additional damper with, you know, but beyond that. So you have to get kind of creative with the parts and uh, you can do that with different shaping. Um, you can also do that with changing the, the density of the material for that internal ring. Um, you know, we've worked on some applications that uh, 
that spent 11,500 RPM right from the factory. Uh, and that's a V12 application. So we had to use all of those tactics, uh, even advanced cooling. So, I mean, the, the technology, the base technology has been around since the 1940s, but the applications that we're working on it, they change almost every day, just fitting needs. Well, guys, before we go any further, I want to make sure that I give you the good stuff when it comes across. And right now we have Dwayne Lafur from uh, Western New York. He says, hey, you know, you guys are, are well known and you got a great company. So I think that's, you know, the, I think a lot of people recognize who you are really quick, but also got uh, a young a guy from uh, our panelists, one of Braden Fitchum, and he wants to know about how far do your, do your dampeners go back? I mean, for example, you know, let's say a 68 small, par, small block Mopar to a big block Mopar. How far back does your product go? And I guess what they're trying to find out is, can it be adapted to anything? What kind of year is our cutoff? The biggest thing for adapting the parts is you want to make sure that you're using the right balance uh, parts. Um, the, the term harmonic balancer is kind of a misnomer, but it's also some of them do have a balance weight built into them. And I know some of the older Mopar stuff ran cast crankshafts that do have a counterweight part of it. Uh, but if you're running a neutral balance part, uh, I know that the, the Mopar stuff covers all of the LA series engines. I believe we cover back even further than that with something like the Paw Spherical 318. Um, and uh, we have, we also offer a one for the early the early Chrysler engines. Uh, like the Firepower, the Soto Fire Dog, um, the Red Ram. Uh, so I, I guess it just it depends on um, what application you're working with. But there's this one thing that we do that uh, a lot of our competitors don't really do is we actually offer uh, what we call a customer print. So if, if somebody calls up and they have an application, either you know they want to check to make sure that the parts can fit what they're working with, or they want to work on something custom. We offer a, a PDF of a customer print that we can send out for a given part number, and it gives you all the basic, you know, dimensions for the outside diameter, for you know, a nominal size for the bore, and then the pulley offsets and what bolt patterns on there. So you know, we try to go out of our way to give our customers as much information as we can to see if it's going to work, you know, before you make a purchase. Okay, well, thanks you. Thank you for that. I got a few more questions here, and one it pertains to from Derek Dixon, and he'd like to know: Are you guys going to be improving your existing 3.0 liter V6 dampener uh, as you move forward? Um, I think I'm trying to. Uh, do you know? I'm guessing what engine makes that for? Because there's a lot of uh, three liter stuff out there. Um, I know we do a three liter Duratec. Okay, that's the one. 200 miles to, so yeah. that's for the, for the Duratec. Do you have any uh, any plans on that, Aaron, on the Duratec? Well, one of the things with our fluid amper line, because it's not an OEM style line, we're free to uh, go through and improve the parts. So like, uh, you know, we have an, an advancement in bearing technology since I started here as, you know, we, we went from like an insert thrust bearing to um, more of a molded ring application that gives us a little more um, durability the ability to handle, uh, you know, if you get into a run application, which is really common, high performance parts, so that, that crank flows can run on the ground. Um, and I know that that's something that's already been applied to that particular part. As far as um, if there's a special feature that's needed with these parts, it doesn't interfere with uh, the overall operation of the parts. And let's say you need a, you know, a PTO drive of a certain size or bolt pattern. The, you know, we always recommend, you know, encourage customers to get a hold of our tech support line. And then they'll come to me, and then we can look and see if we can something we can incorporate into the parts. And especially if it's something that's going to help out, um, you know, the industry as a whole that piece of parts. Um, but yeah, that, that's and I think it's exactly because I had a follow up from Derek, and he was wondering, okay, Ford is, as well as Mazda. So he sounded like he must be a, a customer engine guy. And he's running into some different things as far as his day-to-day -day operation. And I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be my follow-up question is, is there an access for somebody who does a variety of customer builds? You know, can they have call in and say, hey, I'm running into this problem or I'm seeing this or seeing that. And you guys can help give them the direction they need to go into. And, and also uh, maybe it's time for a new product that maybe you haven't even thought about. I'm, 
I doubt it, but at the same time, you never know. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always good new applications. You know, we get calls every day for, you know, people looking for new applications. And, um, you know, we, even if it's not something we can provide right away, we record people's requests. And then, you know, if, if, and then we always go through after a certain period of time, we evaluate how many requests we've had for a certain application. Mm -hmm. And then we can bring those, uh, you know, to the forefront. Um, a good example of that is a part that's uh, already been machined, and I think we're just we're waiting to do a marketing release on it. But uh, I think something popped up on Fluid Amper's Instagram account. But uh, we're doing something for the the RV20 and the RV25 Nissan in line six. Um, I can confirm so, that it's sitting on my desk, the RV20 <laughs> and the RV25, and look for that shortly after the holidays. Um, but that was just came from a customer request, and mm -hmm. the way to. Um, uh, to get that ball rolling for those in the audience, it's support at fluiddamper.com mm -hmm. or 716-592-1000 is the, uh, the support lines. Again, that's uh, support at fluiddamper.com. So, and if you're lucky, you'll get to talk to Ivan. You know, he's real sharp. Um, I mean, our, our whole tech support team is real sharp, but, you know, we've got Ivan, Paul, and Nick. Um, you know, and they're, they're our normal business hours um, are from, you know, eight in the morning to 4.30 uh, Eastern time. So if you want to talk to someone on the phone, you can call during those hours during the weekdays, um, or you can send an email, like, let's say you come up with something later at night, just send an email to like Brian said, support at fluidamper.com. Um, and if, if you can't, you know, if you don't remember the website, you can just go to right to fluidamper.com. We have a contact us portion of we got another question also from a gentleman named Yules Garcia, and he was questioning, you know, do fluid dampeners increase, increase horsepower and how much heat does it reduce compared to a regular dampener? And that's in racing engines. So that's a good question. By, by definition, the power, it's not a power adder part. So like, let's say, um, you know, increasing, um, Increasing your, your wastegate pressure on the turbocharger is going to give you more power. It should give you more forced induction or doing a, um, you know, like a, you know, like nitrous injection, stuff like that, or power adders because they're affecting the power to fuel ratio. Um, they do give, they are a power adder in the aspect that they help increase the engine's overall efficiency. Uh, because if you were to, you know, look at the end of the crankshaft, when that's uh, rotating, you know, in and out of phase in a circular motion, most of the time, your timing drive is running off the front of your crankshaft, um, so you're you're already you're already throwing those amplitudes back into your timing system. You're also getting um, you know side loading and extra loading on your oil your oil films for your mains and for your connecting rods, so you're losing power to due to those things when you have your crankshaft nose vibrating more than optimally. So a lot of times we'll see power increases when we dyno test back to back with a damper that's um, not working as best as it can. So we'll see an increase in power on the dyno when we go through and test those parts, mainly because you're increasing the efficiency of the engine through more accurate timing. And also, you know, by fr reducing frictional losses as your oil films and your main journals, rod journals. But you can also, you know, there are also uh, other benefits too. So let's say you've got a really bad resonance uh, that you're coming up on when you're when you want to push more RPM so that way you, you know you can find it out and get more power. Um, so if you can free up your, your crankshaft resonance to either move it to a more strategically positioned spot so you can operate at a higher RPM, you can make power at a higher RPM too. Um, but it's it's not like say purchasing a camshaft to uh, be a power adder in and of itself. It's just increasing the efficiency of your engine as a whole. I've got a question from you. Uh, for from me, I'm just curious about when I was helping Junior Johnson up in the engine room back in my younger days. Uh, we were talking about you know balancers and this, that, and the other, and how important it was and why it was important. And he he was more feeling. It to, his opinion was it helps the durability. He said yeah. you got you get a frequency that a that a valve spring or a valve itself doesn't like then all of a sudden you, you create the potential for, for failure. And, and that's the biggest thing is like I say, not so much a horsepower game, but all of a sudden, you know, something starts 
getting a little bit iffy inside the engine. And if your balancer is doing what it's supposed to do, it helps to minimize, you know, I guess you might say the loss of, of, of life along the way. The overall durability, the miles that you can get out of the, the block and everything throughout the power, the valve train, excuse me, uh, is reduced because of that. And I know that, you know, when we were able to get fluid dampeners uh, and all the guys I've ever been around, you know, they couldn't believe what doors got open and the ability to step up, like say, to the next level and not have failures because they finally got something that didn't fail them along the process. Is that a good way to look at it? That's a great way to look at it. You know, it's, it's like buying an insurance policy for your engine. If you have some issues uh, with part failures or part fatigues or even just excessive wear, like let's say you have a race engine that you need the last couple weekends because you have, you're, you have on a crunch for time, so you don't have time to do a teardown and stuff like that between race weekends. Uh, adding a better damper to your engine is going to help you with the you know, wear items that would normally be wear items in your engine. We have a great example of this if we've got time to share it. Um, we, we just started working with Corvette Racing's performance team. Uh, the guys over there are great. If you know them, you know, Vince from Corvette Racing is a pretty great guy to work with. You know, we've got a great rapport with them because we stepped in towards the tail end of the C7R program and they were having some issues where their, their parts were failing. Um, they were melting some rubber rings um, and having some issues, you know, with sometimes as short as eight hours. So they were having some problems with, you know, having to rebuild motors after every race, having to run new dampers every time. Um, so they, you know, they got, and they were getting having some problems with tech support. So they got a hold of us and, you know, we worked with them on a solution so that way they could use it on the tail end of the C7R program. And uh, we actually, we had to beg them to get some parts back so we could do some teardowns to make sure that, you know, we weren't seeing any excessive bearing wear. Um, and, you know, they, they ran some parts for the first three races of the final season of the C7R. And then they ran the rest of the parts for the rest of the season with no issues uh, with, and you know, they sent them back to us. There was no fluid wear, there was no bearing wear. Their engines were very happy. And they, they actually extended the opportunity to us to work with them from the, from the ground floor for the C8R program too. So all the, you know, all those mule videos and all those race car videos with the C8R have been running fluid amper parts. Um, we actually brought some, uh, some patented technology to market for uh, high strength aluminum parts that are non-welded. So you can actually pull them apart and inspect them. So if like the governing body wanted to, you know, if, they're, if they wanted to inspect something, they can actually pull everything apart. They're going to get covered in silicone and they're going to have a hard time cleaning it up, but they can do it. And gentlemen, we only got about a couple of minutes here in our session here. So real quick, I got a gentleman named Jeffrey Bonifay, and he wants to know, is there an expiration date or a cycle time on your fluid dampener product? There is no expiration date on the parts. Um, so a lot of SFI stuff will have an expiration date, but the damper, the dampers don't have an expiration date uh, for certification for SFI or anything like that. Just make sure you keep the documentation card that comes with the part. And that's good as long as the parts, you know, the, the card's legible. Uh, if you lose that card, contact contact us at Fluid Amper Support. Um, and a good way to check your damper, uh, it should be running a little warmer than the engine around it. If it's, uh, you know, working properly, go out and do, uh, you know, drive the engine around, warm it all up. The damper should be running a little warm. Um, if, and, you know, if, you, if you're pushing it kind of hard, you want to look at it, it should be stable below about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if you're pushing beyond 300 degrees Fahrenheit, keep an eye on it. If it starts, um, you know, you, you notice something funny in the engine and the damper starts to go cold, mm -hmm. then you may want to send it in to have it looked at. But in general, it should be running um, at least engine temperature uh, somewhere around 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, from what we've seen, they for uh, for the for the performance engines, especially you know, like V8s and all that, you really don't push enough vibration power through to damage the part. So unless the part gets a dent in it or you wear out the press fit, it's it's still going to be working. I mean, we've had some people send in parts from 1985 and we test them on our test bed and they're still working just as good as new. Well, if I could really quick get one last question in there, I think it's important. Is the fluid dampener, is it affected, you know, if you attach, you know, I guess you might say at the end of the crankshaft, such as the things, a dry sump oil pump or a vacuum pump, does that affect any of the uh, performance? That uh, if you add a little bit of weight to the front nose of the crankshaft, 
that's going to change your uh, vibration frequency a little bit. Uh, that's why guys would, you know, for the longest time, blower motor applications would say, oh, well, you don't really need it because of the belt. But that's because you're adding an extra weight to the nose of the crankshaft. So you're changing where the frequency is usually attracted to a lower RPM. Um, and that's actually where that doesn't hurt the damper performance at all. Um, and if anything, it actually will uh, give you a little bit more stabilization on the nose of the crankshaft. Um, but we, you know, the, you know, we we offer uh, some parts that actually are designed to work with like ARE dry sumps and stuff like that. Well, guys, we really appreciate you being a part of our, our seminar session here. However, you want to sum it up, you've done uh, great work. I think everybody pretty much they got confidence in fluid damper. Continue the good work, Brian. Appreciate you being here, Aaron. Also, and uh, again, have a great day and a super 2021. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for Zeke. Appreciate the opportunity. Of, of course. And, and again, if anybody has any questions, they can contact our, our tech support line, uh, support at fluiddamper.com. Uh, also, the website fluiddamper.com has a wealth of information too. So, oh uh, yeah, we're available after the seminar here if anybody wants to reach out direct to the company. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian, thank you. for your support. And thank you, Aaron. Registering on EPAR Trade is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the drop-down. Then, enter your job title. Choose Claim Company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose Join Company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now, and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.